Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my December 2023 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. I'm going to start with my nerdy hardcore stats and charts and then get into what I read. Also, I put chapter markers in all of my videos, so if there's anything you need to skip over or go back to, all of that is down below. On your way down to check out the chapter markers, make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and hit that notification bell if you actually want to be notified when I post videos. This was my biggest reading month of the year because in December I read 20 things for a total of 6,368 pages. Thank you Queer Lit Readathon because half of those things I read in that one week. That takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages, so about 1,215 of those pages were actually about 29 hours of audio. Which is honestly the least amount of audio I think I've had in a month. The age breakdown for these books was 8 adult books, 11 YA books, and 1 middle grade book. I read 14 novels, 5 graphic novels, and 1 novella. This month I read mostly contemporary and horror, followed by mystery thriller, fantasy, non-fiction, romance, and historical fiction. If you adjust by page numbers, not much changes. The biggest chunk of these books were from the library, but I did read books purchased from a chain bookstore and one from Kindle. I read 10 paperbacks, 4 hardcovers, 4 audiobooks, and 2 ebooks. The biggest chunk of my books were in the 300 to 399 page range, and most were published since 2020. Most of the authors were women, but there was a 40-45% split on male and female protagonists, with a non-binary protagonist, a dual narrative, and a non-fiction without a particular protagonist. In terms of setting, most of these were set in the US, but I had reads from the UK, other worlds, New Zealand, Jordan, and Palestine. In terms of diversity of subject matter, half were queer, which is no surprise given this month's round of the Queer Lit Readathon. Another quarter were intersectional, others had to do with race and mental health, and only two books had no diversity to speak of. In terms of star ratings, this month I had one 2.5 star read, one 3 star read, six 3.5 star reads, five 4 star reads, three 4.5 star reads, and four 5 star reads. Let's start with our lowest rated read and work our way up to highest, shall we? Now my 2.5 star read this month is actually the second in a duology that I read this month, so I'm gonna tell you what it is just so I can put it as a chapter marker, and um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of why I didn't like it, but obviously being the second in a duology I can't really tell you all too much. That one is called Timber Dark, it's the follow-up to Wranglestone, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, and basically I could have just done this as the one book in the series. This one had to do a lot with miscommunication or rather people just not talking to each other and then there were a lot of these like daydream like things where the character was just picturing somebody else pretty much in the nude and this happened over and over and over again and I just didn't need that. I got bored and mostly finished it because of the whole completist mentality. But if I was just a little bit more bored, I might have DNF'd. On to my three star read, which is In the Ring. This is something I read for the Queer Lit Readathon. And this is about a character who's going to therapy, and the therapist basically says, You should probably do something physical that might help you out. I want you to find a physical activity. She's recently had something kind of traumatic happen that she hasn't actually talked to her therapist about. And at that scene, the person who actually saved her from that situation is her next door neighbor. When she goes, to a boxing gym, she finds out that that is the boxing gym that he also goes to, and then there's this budding will they or won't they thing going on, as well as other things going on. This was just kind of okay, there was a lot of things to it that were just kind of convenient. I did enjoy seeing how these characters interacted, and the situation that they found themselves in was a little bit distraught credulity, but it was kind of interesting, and yes it did make me want to kind of try boxing, however that's not offered at my gym and I'm not getting another gym membership just so I can try out Boxing. On my 3.5 star reads, the first graphic novel I'm going to talk about is Paper Planes. This is about two characters who have done something that we don't know what it is at the beginning of the book, and they've been sent away to this camp for delinquent youths. This was actually the first thing I read for the Queer Lit Readathon because I really like reading my shortest things near the beginning of that week. That way I feel like I've gotten through more things as we're going and it actually gives me a boost to the start of the week. So this being my shortest thing, that's what I read. And because this was basically 19 or 20 books ago, I can't really remember all too many details. Besides, I really enjoyed seeing how the characters got along with the other people in the camp and I really wanted to know what happened and how that was going to resolve. My next 3.5 star book is Wranglestone, which like I said, is the first book, the one that's before Timberdark, in the Wranglestone duology. The thing about filming during the week is uh, sometimes other people are up and about and need to shower, so if you can hear water rushing, 
I'm sorry, that's just gonna happen because I do not have time to film this any other time. Wranglestone really stuck out to me as something I wanted to read because the premise is that there has been a zombie apocalypse and there's a small group of people living in this national park called Wranglestone. They actually live on these little islands in the middle of this lake and they're fine most of the year except for during winter when the lake freezes and zombies can get to them much more easily. Our main character has a crush on another boy who lives on one of the other islands, but his father doesn't really like our main character because he sees our main character as weak and not really an outdoorsy type of guy, and it goes from there. I did enjoy many aspects of this. I liked seeing these characters get together, and there were twists and turns in this that I didn't see coming, but like I said, the second book, I don't feel like it needed to exist. Next to my 3.5 star list is Crank. I mostly read this because it's getting banned in places and I wanted to see why. This one is written in poetry. I actually listened to it as an audiobook and the thing that really solidified to me that it must be written in verse is it's about a five hour audiobook but it's like 500 pages long so I figured that must be going on. Also a little bit of the way the narrator was speaking I could tell there were line breaks but it flowed really well. This book is about a girl named Christina who's actually going to visit her father who she hasn't seen in about eight years and when she gets there it's it's not a great situation. Like she's been building him up in her mind for quite some time and when she gets there it's kind of a shitty situation and she falls pretty quickly into like the underbelly of the society here because she meets a boy who she thinks is cute and he's into drugs. She quickly gets into drugs. It's all about getting into drugs. It is my understanding that this is the first in a six book series. I originally thought it was a three book series but I think there's actually six books in this series and it was initially written because the author's daughter went through something similar and I think she was just trying to process her feelings. I thought it was really well written. There were some things that are kind of dated and I wouldn't have written into a book like this if I were writing it now. For example, our main character has an older sister who is a lesbian and she kind of makes some comments about that that I could have lived without. And I'm sure there were other word choices that I had objections to. For context, this book did come out in 2004, so these would have been commonplace things even though they really shouldn't be because they're not great. Next we have Gorgeous Gruesome Faces. This is a YA horror novel about about this person who is really wanting to get back into the limelight. She actually used to be a part of this trio that was part of this TV show turned pop girl group and basically something happened that stopped that in its tracks and she's decided to go to this new program so that she can try to get back into that life. However, one of the girls that she used to be in that group with is also there, so they're competing against each other. And then some very screwed up and creepy things start happening. This was quite a quick read for me. I really enjoyed going through it, trying to figure out what was happening, the twists and turns that were happening, whether or not people were going to get through things, the way that people were re responding to these different things that were happening at this training camp were really interesting because, uh, yeah, it was really intense. And I wonder if people would actually just turn a blind eye as much as they did in real life. They probably would. People are terrible. Next we have You Exist Too Much. This was one of the group reads for the Queer Lit Readathon and it's about this woman who is a DJ in New York but she's lived all over the world. Her family is originally from Palestine and at some point her mother and father relocated to the DC area. She's now living in New York and she has this strained relationship with her mother because her mother doesn't accept that she's queer. She also has this love addiction Addiction, so she's constantly just trying to be loved by other people and that leads to her being quite a serial cheater and she actually checks herself into treatment for this. This went in a lot of locations that I didn't anticipate because I'd like to go into my books not knowing too much about what's going on and it was really written in these vignettes where you're seeing different points in her life and how they compare to different locations and times that she's found herself in. Overall it was enjoyable and an interesting read and not something I would have necessarily picked up outside of this prompt so I'm glad I read it. Next we have Men, Murder, and Makeup, which is the first book in the Drag Queen Detective series. And I kind of want to read the other books, but I've got so many other books to get to first. This one is about a man who is a hairdresser in this very small town. He's actually busy all the time because he's paired back his days at his salon because he owns it to only Saturdays, so he only takes on clients he really, really wants and other people work the other days. And the thing about him is, sure, this is his job, this is what everybody in the community knows him for, but he also has a side gig 
Drag, where he's a drag queen at the one local queer club. And on top of that, he's also a mystery writer who lives in the area by the name of Vicky Dean, and nobody knows the identity of Vicky Dean. To the point where Vicky Dean actually owns this little cottage by the seaside where she writes, and he actually goes there in drag sometimes, just so people will think they've seen Vicky Dean around. But a lot of people kind of look down on Vicky Dean because they know she lives there. She's wildly popular, so she clearly has money, but people never really see her spending any of that money locally. As our main character is out for a drink with his best friend, they find out that the mayor has been shot, and it looks like Vicky Dean's car was actually leaving the scene, which is confusing to him because he's Vicky Dean, and he knows he didn't shoot the mayor. From there, he has to prove his innocence and try to not give up the fact that he happens to be this best-selling mystery author. This one was a fun premise. It was pretty camp at points, which is something I actually expect from a book like this, so it works really well. I think that it was a lot of fun. There were a lot of twists and turns trying to figure out who it was, and there is a budding romance that would not work in real life uh, just because of professional reasons, but in a book like this, I was okay with it. On to my four-star reads, the first one being a graphic novel called Squire. This is about a young woman who lives on the fringes of her society because of her ethnic class and she decides she wants to join the army to eventually become a knight because people know knights names they know their legendary weapons there's all these cool stories about them but to become a knight you have to first be a squire this is all about training and political strategy but then also trying to figure out that what you're being told might not necessarily be the truth you see the thing is that she's joined this army under kind of false pretenses because the people in her society actually tattoo on their arms that they're part of that society, but she's had it covered the entire time because people in this army actually look down on her ethno class. This one was drawn really well, it was an interesting story, and I definitely recommend it. Next, another fairly short audiobook, we have Thornhedge. This is by T. Kim Fisher, and instead of this being horror, this was actually more fantasy, and it's the first time I'm reading any of T. Kim Fisher's fantasies, so this was interesting for me. This one is about a character who has been tasked with staying in this one area next to this magical tower covered in briars, and you kind of come to realize what fairy tale inspired this as you go along. And this character's actually been there for hundreds of years and one day this knight comes by because he heard a story about this tower and he basically wants to verify it and this unlikely friendship comes up between these two characters because she doesn't really want him to get into the tower but he's not leaving unless he does. This also has a lot of flashbacks to how she found herself in this situation and I just thought it was a really interesting take on this particular story. I really like when people are able to take fairy tales and craft a different story from a different point of view in that fairy tale. I find that really, really fascinating. So if you've tried other genres that T. Kingfisher has written and you're interested in this one, definitely pick it up. Next we have A Haunting on the Hill. This is another one that I consumed as an audiobook, and it's interesting to do so in this format for a very particular reason. The story behind this one is our main character is this writer, she is a playwright, and she's taking time off to actually finish writing this one play. While she's on a weekend vacation with her girlfriend, she gets in her mind that it would be really cool to rent this really weird, creepy house in the middle of nowhere and bring some of the cast and crew together to actually work on the project. Now the thing that makes this interesting about listening to it as an audiobook is occasionally there are extra sound effects, but it's not all the way throughout the book. So there was a point where I was actually on a walk, I was just walking down the road, probably to the gym, and as the character is driving up to this house for the first time, I actually start hearing the sounds of a car driving behind me, and I look behind me and there's no car there, and that's something I'm really particularly watching out for because I don't trust drivers and there's no sidewalks on that road, so I always have my audiobook down enough that I can hear ambient sounds and if I need to get out of the way I get out of the way but as I look behind me there's not actually a car and that's because it was one of the sounds in the audiobook. Now the fact that they are actually rehearsing and producing a play with these kind of creepy songs to it is so interesting because that is found in the audio as well as the fact that one of the people that goes to the house is an audio designer and everybody who goes to this house a different weird thing starts happening to them. Them. I thought this was a really cool take on a haunted house situation, and it was definitely in the category of messy queers. Next we have Candidly Klein. This was my middle grade novel that I read this month, again for the Queer Lit Readathon, and it's about this character named Klein who has music in her blood. She has music in her family. Her mom used to love playing the piano. Her grandmother and grandfather used to own a music shop, but when her grandfather passed and her grandmother moved in with them, they actually sold it. And her mother's been busting her butt working at this diner and finds it really hard to make ends meet, so she doesn't 
have a lot of time for things that are fun, like music. So when her daughter wants to pursue music, she's like, that's not going to pay the bills. I'm not paying for you to go to this class that you just learned about because no. However, Klein really wants to go. So she starts trying to figure out how she can scrape the money together and how she can actually get herself to this singer songwriter class. She has a little bit of help from other women in her life to orchestrate this and keep it away from her mom. And when she's there, she meets this character that she ends up having to write a song with and a budding relationship forms. This one was fun and cute and I just love protagonists that are going for what they want in a creative field. So I very much enjoyed it. The novella that I read this month is The Only Safe Place Left is the Dark. This is a horror novella about this guy who is living in the woods. He's been living by himself for quite some time because about six months after he got to the woods, is zombie apocalypse broke out and that's obviously changed the way the world works. However, shortly before he started living in the middle of nowhere by himself, he actually started taking a medication for his HIV and he now needs to go out into the world occasionally to stockpile that medication. As this novella starts, there is a knock on his door, which is just not a good sign and this gets very bloody and action-packed from here. I don't know what it was about this month and queer zombie books, but here we are and I very much enjoyed this one. It was just so action Packed. There was never a moment where it lulled, even when you were going back and kind of learning things about his backstory. It was just so full of emotion and just pushing the plot forward, and I very much enjoyed it. On to my 4.5 star reads, we have Tim Tamaro and the Subterranean Heartsick Blues. This is about characters who live in this magic school in New Zealand that's actually underground, and there are different specialities of magic, so they're studying based on the different types of magic they personally have. As this book opens, our main character Tim has recently found out that his girlfriend is leaving him for this other boy. As he's feeling pretty down on himself, this guy that he's never gotten along with comes up to him and is like, hey, so so I heard about your girlfriend, she's now going out with my roommate, and I kind of had a situation ship with him that is clearly now ended, so I think that we should mess with them. Tim doesn't really want to do this because he doesn't want anything to do with Elliot, but the way they end up deciding to mess with them is actually switching partners for a big project that is coming up. This project is something that I've heard high school students having to do before, and it's basically two people coming together to take care of an egg as though it is an actual creature, as though it is your baby. That whole thing that happens in some high schools. But of course this is a magic school, so this egg is magically enchanted and will do things like cry or coo or whatever it needs to do based on what the parents are doing. Tim and Elia kind of figure that the new couple are going to do really badly at this and it's actually going to break them up, and they find that hilarious, but they come to realize that Megan, their egg, really likes it when both her daddies are present, which forces some proximity. This was really fun. Even though it's a fantasy set at a magic school, it was pretty light on the magic until they came to the realization that something happened and they need to use magic to fix it, but they don't know how. And I just thought this was absolutely cozy and delightful. Next we have Just One Bite, which is the North American title for the second book in the Hangman series. The Hangman series is about this guy named Timothy Blake. Actually, I think it's called the Timothy Blake series. The first book is Hangman. And he's quite an interesting character because he consults for the FBI because he's really good at problem solving, but the fee he collects at the end of that is actually a recently deceased corpse from death row because he is in fact a cannibal. Obviously this is not a well-known thing. People don't tend to know that this is the fee that he is collecting besides the guy that hires him at the FBI. And this is a very interesting character to be in the perspective of for these books. In this second book, his job situation has changed a little bit and gotten a little bit more complicated. And somebody from the first book actually comes back into his life because he is given a new case. And this new case definitely gets complicated. I've really liked this series so far and I'm really sad that my library doesn't have books three or four, so I'm gonna ask them to purchase them, hoping that they won't just discard the two books that they currently have in the series because the last time I tried to get them to get a book from kind of an older series that was a little bit more obscure because I actually read I think the second or third in the series and I asked them to get the other books from the series and they just discarded the one copy of the one book they had rather than get the whole series, which why? I mean, I get it, but also it's annoying. These books are fast paced, filled with riddles. Every chapter starts with a riddle, so that's kind of fun. And you just wanna know how he's gonna get through this situation because you really shouldn't be rooting for him, but you kind of do in the same way that you root for Dexter. Finally, for this category, we have A Merry Little Meat Cute. Now, this is a book that is co-authored by two authors I've read from before, and I was delighted to see this pairing, actually, because Julie Murphy, I come to think of as like quite cozy and fat rep and queer stuff, 
and I really like that. And then Sierra Simone is Smut. I've only read Smut by her. I don't know if she writes anything else. So seeing those two people come together for this book was just great. This was our mostly dual perspective novel. There is one other perspective kind of at the beginning and end of the book, but for the most point it is dual perspective. Between B, who is an indie plus size adult film star, who accidentally finds herself as a lead in a Christmas movie that's going to be shooting over the next two weeks, because the guy that's actually producing this Christmas movie is actually also an adult film producer and he's trying to make the crossover, and when they need a new leading lady because of a disaster that happens right before filming, the director actually sees her photo because he's got this stack of photos from his other gig and is adamant that B is in her movie. The lead of this movie is an ex-boy band member that B was actually obsessed with when she was younger and actually saw him in concert and all those things and he is actually a subscriber to her adult entertainment so they know of each other already before they meet up but they're both told for different reasons that they should not hook up. B's told that because the producer really wants this to go well and doesn't want any drama on set and he basically has this bad boy image that he's trying to clean up from his boy band days and if this job doesn't go well he won't be able to support his mom and sister. They're in this town that's always set up for Christmas year-round, they're filming this Christmas movie, it's a period piece, and a bunch of the people that are in the crew had to be replaced last minute too so there are people dotted here and there who are definitely used to more adult content than this very wholesome Christmas movie they're trying to create. This was honestly just an absolute delight. One of my five star reads, I said earlier that there were four of them, that is accurate, however one of them is a standalone non-fiction book and one of them is three volumes of a graphic novel series and either of them really could be at the top of this list and I just kind of had to basically flip a coin to figure out which one I was going to talk about first. The first one is The Hundred Years War on Palestine. This is an incredibly impactful thing to read especially with what's going on in the world and what has been going on in the world when it comes to Palestine for over a hundred years now. I particularly asked my library to acquire this as an audiobook because this subject is quite dense and I knew that I was going to be able to process more of it if I heard it as an audiobook than if I were just trying to read it on the page. And I'm really happy to know that there's at least a couple of dozen other people that have holds on this audiobook so I'm glad that it could benefit our community because we had the e-copy and we had a print copy in our library but having this as a resource means that more people can consume this information. I want to be brief here so I'm not going to go into too many details but I found this a really good text to give you a background on the history of this area and and I just want to say, free Palestine, we are still boycotting St. Martin's Press if you're not aware. I have information about that down in the description below, and I really hope there is a ceasefire soon. The three volumes of a graphic novel series that I read this month, and obviously very much enjoyed because they're at the top of my list, are Heartstopper volumes 3, 4, and 5. For some reason when I was reading this before I only got until the end of the second volume, and then I always meant to read a little bit more and then just never got around to it, started watching the show, the show went further than I'd actually read it that point and then it was actually really fun to go back and read through some of the scenes that I'd seen on the screen. It was also a little bit bittersweet to get to the end of the fifth volume and realize that there is only one more volume after this. However, I do know there's at least a couple of novellas and I should really get around to reading those. If you've never seen this webcomic turned graphic novel series before, it's about these two boys and their budding relationship in the UK, and it's just really adorable, really wholesome, but then also has these very impactful conversations when it comes to different things to do with mental health and family and all of those dynamics, and I just really, really love it. If you want to hear me talk more about these books or other books for that matter, the playlist for my weekly entertainment wrap-ups is always linked down below. If you've read any of these, please let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a Ko-fi account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that, as always, is down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye!